Welcome folks to Coffee with Kalefi, another edition. We're gonna be talking about debris and particle removal today. So thanks everybody for joining. Hopefully everything's going well with you at home and at work. Um, interesting topic, we've covered it a couple times before, but there's always something new and interesting to talk about this. I've learned something every time I, uh, I research this topic. So hopefully you'll find this useful. Um, type in questions as we go. Cody's gonna be monitoring questions. I've got, oh, what about eight pre-submitted questions here that I'll cover as I go through the slides. And um, yeah, we'd love to hear from you as far as uh, how we're doing on these presentations or if you have any other topic ideas, uh, certainly send them in. Um, so anyways, let's get rolling on the topic, uh, debris and particle removal of hydronic systems. Now when I say hydronic systems, that could be a solar system, it could be a chilled water system for some of you folks in the south that don't have hydronic heating systems per se, it does pertain to chilled water, it could be a geo, uh, closed loop geo system, so it applies to anything to do with water or fluids really. So this is what I'm going to try and get through in the time that we have today. Uh, types of uh, debris and system, where it comes from, how we get rid of it, how we identify it going forward, how we make sure that our systems stay, uh, stay clean and healthy. So, and there's a lot uh, involved in all those. So I would say the two most common things that I hear of uh, when I was doing service calls or when I follow the social media sites and all the uh, chat rooms out there, most of the time, especially when it's a do-it-yourself or a homeowner, the, the problems that they're having have to do with either air or dirt. You know, they've got lack of performance, they've got boilers that are failing, they've got indirect tanks that are getting pinholes in them. It can usually be traced back to uh, air or dirt problem. I mean, obviously equipment fails and breaks from time to time, but most of the common problems have to do with um, air, or dirt, and debris. We've covered air a couple times, but uh, we're gonna drill down a little bit further on dirt and debris today. So those are all, um, things that can go wrong when you have dirt and debris in your system. I would say efficiency and longevity are probably the big ones that people uh, notice. They say, you know, I just replaced this old boiler with a high efficiency boiler and, the, you know, my fuel bills haven't gone down. How do I know this thing is working right? Well, it could be, in fact, the, the fill water that you put in there the first day is put a scale coating on that heat exchanger and you're not getting the, the heat transfer that you paid for. So uh, we'll talk about how that can be avoided and how going forward you can prevent that from happening. So. What else we got there? Longevity, yeah, warranty. So this is another big one. I just noticed one of the boiler manufacturers just came out with a statement. It's in their manuals now that if you have a failure in one of their products and it doesn't meet the water criteria that's in their installation manual, uh, there is no warranty. And they'll know that or they'll find that out if you send in a uh, the heat exchangers that obviously they open up and they see a scale layer in there that's not the fault of the boiler so know that i think when one manufacturer puts his foot down and draws a line in the sand so to speak about warranty and not honoring warranties uh from aggressive waters or debris in the system that you'll probably see the rest of the manufacturers follow suit with that so they're gonna uh, you know they're gonna clamp down on that warranty issue as far as if it's a uh, product failure having to do with dirt and debris or aggressive water in the system so what is the debris? Where does it come from? What type of debris? That's, a, as you can see, a, a section of cast iron boiler that's laying on its side, and you can see some of the debris that's in the uh, the connection port on that boiler. That's uh, that's debris that didn't come with the boiler. That's debris that's accumulated in that over years of um, operation. It could have been from fill water coming into that system. It could have been an old iron pipe system that's been, you know, scaling away and putting deposits in the system. So. Some of the particles will come along with the pipe and the fittings when you buy it. We'll talk about you know, how they manufacture tube and the oils and the different things that might be in the tubing as you, it arrives on the job site. Most of the time it comes in with your fill water. You know, unless you're using demineralized water, we'll talk about how you can do that on the job site. You're putting scale in your system. I mean, all water has some kind of ions and minerals or salts, we call it sometimes, in the water. Uh, most of the time it's not healthy for your system, for your pumps for your heat exchangers, for your boilers. So we would like to start out with good water. That would uh, alleviate a lot of the problems we have, especially with uh, high efficiency heat exchangers that don't like any, even a you know a cardboard thickness of scale buildup inside of a, a heat exchanger with a high efficiency boiler. It's gonna cause uh, performance problems, sometimes noise problems. Then the aggressiveness of the fluid if the pH is low or high, uh, especially with aluminum block boilers. Some of you folks I know are using uh, aluminum block boilers. A very tight pH range is acceptable in aluminum block boilers. So if the fluid that you're putting in there doesn't meet that spec again, you're gonna have problems uh, with that boiler stuff from day one. 
Oxygen can get into the system. It can get in through air vents, can get in around pump seals. There's a lot of places that oxygen can get in there. If you have oxygen in there, you've got ferrous metals in there, you can have uh, corrosion, ongoing corrosion. So we want to address that, eliminate that. It's you know more of an air issue. We'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about air elimination, how that can help dirt and debris uh, from forming just by getting all that oxygen out of the system, keeping it out of the system. Then just starting out, you know, flushing it properly, putting a cleaner in there. If you have a dirty system, know that the glycols or whatever you're blending to put in your system, if you're using different types of fluids and geo systems, you know, that should really be blended with good water. You don't want to take bad city or well water that's got, you know, pH that's out of whack or a lot of uh, conductivity, a lot of TDS in that water and blend it with your, with your glycols or your other fluids or you pretty much ruin those fluids from day one. And then you got you to go back every at least every two years and test that fluid. That's where you're going to identify a problem before it gets to this here condition. You know, it's slipping away from you, you know, year by year. If you can go there with a little test kit and test that fluid, test that water, that glycol, whatever the fluid that you're adding in your system, you can head off those problems before they turn into big expensive problems. So what we have that can help you from Kleppy is a couple ways. If you're going to fill a system, you want to purge it out. You want to get all the dirt and debris, both the stuff that came with the system, the stuff that you put in there as you, you know, drilled holes and put tubing through sawdust or solder flux and pipe. Dust. So the key to that is having a good fill rate, a good a high GPM fill rate so that as you're not only pushing out your air with a high fill rate, you're pushing out dirt and debris because you got to get that fluid velocity up oh, around three, four or five feet per second to make sure that the heavy dirt particles, the rust particles, the shavings from your copper pipe or whatever can move along there. So what's unique about the Kleppy fill valves, the autofills, is that we have a high flow rate. This valve right here, a little half inch autofill valve, it's going to fill at five gallons a minute. As soon as you open this valve up and you set the pressure, let's say you want 12 PSI fill pressure on there, you set it at 12 pounds there. There's no levers, there's no hoops, there's no screws. This is going to fill at 5.2 actually gallons per minute when you first turn that on all the way up to the, get to the fill pressure. Now it does taper off as you get close to the 12 pounds that fill obviously is going to slow down, but you can just set this and forget it. That's kind of what we uh, talk about this valve. That's a what we say is just set it and walk away from it. So now if you want to go and start purging radiators, or if you got bleeders on your baseboard or something like that, you don't have to worry about running back and catching this before it gets up to 30 PSI and you pop the relief valve on your uh, boiler and you've got a mess somewhere. So it's a fast fill valve all the time. If you need a little bit more fill, you can go into our three quarter size here. I'm showing it as a combination with a uh, testable type of backflow preventer. You can buy it uh, as a combo on both these valves. You can buy it with gauges. So you've got a, an indication of what you've actually filled the system to. The gauge can also be used for troubleshooting. If you've got a, a leak in the system somewhere and the gauge starts dropping, you know, it's time to start uh, searching for a leak. This valve here in the three quarter version will fill up about nine gallons per minute. So if you have a larger uh, system, more piping or bigger diameter pipe, it might be good to have a, you know, a valve that can give you a little bit more flow rate when you're filling it just to again assist with the purging of the air get the dirt particles out if you need more horsepower than that here's a half horsepower worth of a pump on our fill purge cart and that'll go up to about 12 gallons per minute you can pump up to about 80 psi so if you really need a good blast maybe even a small geo system or something like that uh, we'd be happy to uh, set you up with one of our purge carts you can mix uh, chemicals in here you know if you're blending glycols on the job site if you want to put some cleaners in there and just run it through a you know if you've got a valve where you can fill and purge on one valve you could use this as a cleaning device also if you just want to set it there and let it run for a couple hours or something like that and then come back and uh, flush it out so it's a multi-function uh, functional tool really is what it is now, some of the stuff that's going to, you're going to find in systems comes along with the manufacturing process of the materials that you're using. When they make um, pipe, if you're buying steel pipe that has threaded ends, somebody threaded those ends and they probably used a lubricant when they threaded that. I doubt that they reach inside there and clean that out. So you're going to have some cutting oil and some residues that are inside the piping when you put it in there. The same thing with copper tubing. The way they make copper tubing is they draw it. They draw it through dyes, and when they draw through those dyes, they use a fluid. It's called a drawing fluid. Most of it burns off from the friction when they pull it through those dyes, but you'll find if you were to take a stick a cotton ball inside a piece of copper pipe and shove it through there, by the time it comes out the other end, it's going to have a little bit of oily film on it. That's some of the, the fluid that was left over inside of that pipe when they made it. Unless you're buying clean refrigeration type of tubing, you're going to have a little bit of uh, 
of that drawing fluid inside there. So if you're welding, you know, you could have some welding slag inside there from the from the arc in there. <clears throat> There's different things that you put in in addition to what the manufacturer sends. And that's true of um, when we make um, brass components. Pretty much everything that we make at Kleppe that's a brass component starts out as a piece of bar stock. And we'll either take that bar stock and just machine it. If it's a small product, like a ball for inside of a quick setter, for example, we'll take a chunk of that bar stock, put it in the milling machines, put it in the multi-turret machines. It turns it into the product. In other cases, we'll take that, uh, that bar stock over to our foundry and we'll forge it. And when we do that, the first step that we do is we take that bar stock and we coat it with graphite and it turns like jet black is when you see this brass going into the forge and say, is that brass or is that a piece of cast thing? Well, it is in fact brass that's coated with cast uh, with a, um, a graphite before it goes into the forge so we can get it out of the mold, out of the dye when it comes out of there. Well, obviously we have to clean that off so that'll get cleaned off, but then it'll go over to our machine shops and it'll go through multiple you know steps depending on if it gets threaded or if it gets bored or whatever the process might be so then after it gets through that process it has to be cleaned again so as it goes through these different steps you can see the potential for there to be a little bit of leftover res uh, residual you know if you've got a small pocket perhaps in here where there's a, a little port going out to i don't know maybe a a PT port or something like that, there could be a little bit of fluid or something that didn't get completely drained or flushed out of it. Obviously, when you fill the system, you know, as soon as your fluid touches that, you're going to have that in the system. So we do the best we can to get all that uh, machining, you know, the sand out of the sand casting on our bigger products, get all the, uh, the oils and the lubrications that we use when we machine or assembly the product. We try and get that out there, but some of it's going to going to slip by. And if you put a dozen brass components in there and you've got a little bit of residue in every one, now you're starting to uh, affect the water, the fill water that you put in it. And uh, so we just want to make sure that you clean that out. Then lastly, the stuff that you put in on the job site, you know, if you're taking copper tubing and cutting it with a tubing cutter, a displacement cut, cutter, put, uh, you know, pushes up a little burr inside there and you take your little pencil reamer, some guys use a unibit or something like that, and they're going to grind that out of there so you don't have a ridge in there upsetting your flow there. Those, you know, particles need to come out of there. Um, if you're cutting with a chop saw or a band saw, you've got sawdust or shavings from that. Uh, at my house, if I leave a piece of anything that's got a hole in it outside in my shop for over a week, it seems like a mud dauber finds its way into there. And uh, after time, we'll completely plug it up. There's a piece of uh, old rubber hose there that I had back in my shed that uh, both ends of it, the mud daubers had built a nest in there. That would be a problem if you put that in the system and didn't... Uh, get that flushed out of there. In fact, that's probably enough that I wouldn't even be able to flush that out with pressure. You got to take a piece of welding rod or a screwdriver, Cody, and jam that out of there before you put it in the system or cut the end of it off. And, you know, just touching and handling it with your gloves. You got pipe dope, you got solder flux. Sometimes there's Loctite on our products that we assemble. We put together with Loctite. It might not all get cleaned out from the inside of the, the part that we assembled. So this is just some examples of things that we want to Get out of there because that's going to affect the fluid quality and it's going to affect the um the way the fluid reacts with the different metals in the system you know know that today's systems we've got a lot of different metals in our systems we've got copper we've got brass we've got cast iron we've got steel we've got a lot of different grades of stainless steel now we've got composites coming into the picture so all of those are going to react differently with different um, chemicals in the water, different oils in the water, different levels of the pH in the water, different chemicals that you might add on the job site like I'm showing here. This is a kit that we um, we make available also is a, a cleaner kit and a conditioner. So it's on a little aerosol can. So all you need to do is screw that onto a um, a hose connection somewhere. Typically our our, our products have a, a garden hose connection on our blow down valves, on our separators and stuff like that. That would be a good spot that you could squirt the, the uh, cleaner in first, run it for a while, flush that out, uh, put good uh, deionized water in it, and then put your conditioner in after it. You know, this is an option. If you're putting good clean water in your system and you did a good cleaning on that system, you should be able to get away with just deionized, deionized or um, distilled water in your system should be adequate to prevent any kind of corrosion or any kind of breakdown in the system. Some of the guys like to add this because it will, you know, buff your pH a little bit. It does put a little film inside your pipe. That's a nice thing to have a little protective uh, patina or film inside your pipe to prevent aggressive fluids if they ever would occur with glycols from attacking your pipe. So that's probably the one that I worry most about is glycol. When glycol gets overheated or if it gets blended with bad water, it turns into a really nasty sludge. It's just a tough thing to get out of a system. It can really um, destroy components. Uh, the softer metals, the brass and the uh, aluminum components really don't like aggressive glycols. They're just 
uh, the pH drops and it just becomes very aggressive to your components. So there are steps. We've talked about this in a couple of the hydronics of uh, how you can use our purge cart to both, you know, flush it out, get the big particles out, put some of the conditioners in there, run it even on an existing system where you just want to tie into it on a couple of, uh, you know, connections with a ball valve between them where you can uh, run a cleaner through there and, and get a, a good flush on the system without having to start over draining it down and refilling the building again. Uh, what else we have there? I'll tell you about these cleaners too. There's two different types of cleaners that you'll see on the market for hydronics. Uh, some of them are just detergent soaps. It's really a, kind of like a powerful dishwashing soap at the end of the day is what's in that cleaner. There's also another type that's an acid. It's gonna be like the Hercules sizzle, uh, similar to the acid that the refrigeration guys use for coil cleaning. And that I would use on a boiler that has a lot of hard water build up inside the boiler, like if it had a leak in the radiant slab and it was taken on fill water day after day after day, then you're gonna see a lot of the hardness uh, minerals in there, the calcium, magnesium and stuff. That's hard for a soap to break down. You really need something that can go in there and dissolve it. Similar to what you might find in the bottom of um, your water heaters. When you drain an old water heater out and you see all that kind of bluish white deposit that comes out of there, that's some of the, you know, the hard scaling minerals that are in your water that have settled out to the bottom of it. It's hard to get those out of a, uh, a copper pipe if you don't have something that can break them down that can dissolve them so you can flush them, flush them through. Hey, Bob, we actually had a good question here, um, and I, I think you got a good answer for them, too. Uh, is there a more or less aggressive glycol? Yeah, so here's the thing about glycols is when you buy a glycol, if you look at the side of the container, typically they're going to come out of the container at a pH somewhere between 9.5 and 10.5. What I found is the, the better names, if I could politely say it, or the more expensive maybe is another way of putting it. Glycols are gonna have a better inhibitor package in them. They put more chemicals in there. I mean, the base glycol really just comes from a, a couple different corporations in the world. Really, Dow makes most of it. Most of the glycols you buy start as a Dow base product. Union Carbide used to supply a lot of it. Some of it's imported now from other companies, but it's really about the, the conditioner package that they add into the glycol that makes it, in my opinion, a good glycol or a, a, you know, not as good glycol. In fact, if you go to Dow, they make an HD, which I guess stands for heavy duty, but they actually put an even better in, um, boost inhibitor package in their HD. And we use the HDs as our solar fluid because they have a little higher operating temperature. They boost it up a little bit with the inhibitor. So if you're using it in a condition where you can see stagnation temperatures of 300 plus degrees, like you can in the solar system, it pays to get the, um, you know, a better brand and a better rating of glycol. So yeah, the, it's like anything else you buy, there's good, better, best, I would say. If you buy glycol for $3 a gallon and you see another one on the shelf for $7 a gallon, it's probably not just the uh, wholesaler making a lot of extra money. There's <laughs> probably a better package in that more expensive uh, glycol. Well, and I would say too, Bob, uh, on the topic of glycol is don't shy away from premixed glycol. You know, when they're yeah. when they're mixing it, they're using deionized water. Um, don't think it's a waste of money to spend, you know, spend all that money on 50-50 on with just water in it. You know, they're they're doing it the right way. And if you aren't capable of doing that on site by using deionized water, buy the buy the premixed stuff. Well, and that's an excellent point for that reason that Cody said, but also, you know, when you blend it on site, if you don't know exactly how much your system holds, how much, you know, glycol do you take with you to the job site? Well, I think I got enough to get me to a 50-50 mix. Sometimes it's not until you get it all pumped in there and you go and take a sample with your refractometer and find you're a little bit too low. So if you just start, like Cody said, with a pre-mix of whatever ratio you want, typically, you know, 30-45 percent, uh, right out of the bucket, then you know the entire system is filled with the proper mix and it's been mixed with uh, the ionized water at the factory. So a lot of the problems, as long as you're putting it in a clean system, you know, a glycol should last 10, 15 years if it's, um, if it's put into a clean system, if you keep an eye on that pH and boost it occasionally if it needs it. And then any comments, Bob, on <laughs> propylene glycol versus ethylene? Yeah, pretty much everything will be propylene glycol. You know, that's a non-toxic or less toxic, I should say. I think it uh, it's called a gross rating, generally regarded as safe rating that they have on that. The ethylene glycols tend to be a little bit more toxic and they don't like to see ethylene or EG glycol used if it's gonna come in contact with a, a heat exchanger for potable water, like an indirect tank or a flat plate heat exchanger. If you're using EG, which does get used in some of the bigger commercial applications, they really want to see double wall heat exchangers on the potable water side if you're going to do that because of the, you know, the potential for that, uh, those two fluids to cross under some condition. 
ethylene glycol is a little less expensive and it is a little bit better heat transfer fluid. It's got a little bit lower viscosity. So, you know, engineers that are really looking at the number closely, if you've got a system that has, you know, thousands of gallons of fluid in it, that can make a difference for the um, design of the system, having that fluid with a better uh, heat transfer ability than the PG. But for the most part, the stuff that we're using on hydronics that you find on the shelf at your wholesaler is going to be a, a propylene or a PG glycol. It could be, a, it could even be a bioglycol. They're making glycols now out of a, um, uh, we sold a corn-based uh, solar fluid for a while that was actually made out of a, you know, bio product instead of a petroleum product as a base for it. So, um, same inhibitors and it's just made from a you know either corn or a, a soy pressings that they make it out of so let's see where so this company this is interesting i met these folks at a a, a geo show in tulsa oklahoma probably maybe 10 years ago or more uh, they had a booth set up right next to us there and i i got to talk to these folks and i said what do you do and they said well we go around purging hydronic systems i said well don't I do that? Isn't that what the you know installer, the mechanical contractor does? He says, well, when you start getting in the big piping systems, you know, maybe a college campus or whatever, a big commercial building might be, he said, for the most part, you don't own a big enough pump to be able to go in there and purge out a six or eight or 10 inch pipe. In fact, this company can purge up to a 24 inch diameter pipe. And he said, the key to this is, he said, you got to get the fluid going through the piping at about five feet per second if you're going to get this type of product flushed out of the pipe. And this is actually came out of one of the jobs they flushed. This is a pile of dirt, sand. It's actually two pieces of plywood with a, a mountain of dirt and sand. And it was a job where they had pushed some piping under a roadway. And apparently in the process of doing that, the cap or whatever came off some of the piping and they got a load of dirt in there. And he said, the average contractor doesn't have enough pumping horsepower typically with them to be able to push this out of a pipe. He said, you really got to get your flow velocity and you can go online. I use the engineering uh, uh, toolbox website. They've got calculators that if you put in a pipe diameter, you can ask it, okay, how many gallons per minute would I need to put through, a, let's say a six inch pipe to get up to this um, flow velocity. They'll put you that in gallons per minute. And that's what they do at uh, Purge, right? They put a flow meter, ultrasonic flow meter on the pipe and it just clamps around the outside of the pipe and they'll just rev up their pumps inside here until they get to this flow velocity. And he said, it's amazing. I think Cody, you went to this website and saw some of the pictures they did with some clear piping. How uh, when they get to this number, like nuts and bolts and wrenches and parts start flowing out of this clear plastic piping right when they get up to uh, this kind of flow velocity. So it, uh, it, it was a pretty eye-opening uh, experience for me to learn that uh, it takes a lot more uh, pumping power and flow power than most people have. So. Yeah, the clear pipe was definitely a, a, a an eye-opening experience for me as well. I mean, the the fact that yeah, you know, you're you're usually, especially on these residential applications, looking at two to four feet per second velocities, you know, uh, in your in your for your flow in your piping, and and maybe a little bit higher in your commercial. Uh, you just don't have, like you said, you don't have enough pumping power to to move stuff around for the most part, especially debris, maybe maybe air, but not debris. And and this is where these guys really come into come into play. Yeah, and a little teaser as far as that goes. I was just going through uh, some of Ron George's slides. He did an excellent presentation for uh, a PHC Pros here recently on Legionella, and he talked about how you have to flush these buildings, and he talked about the same thing here. In fact, he had a chart in there showing pipe diameters and what kind of flow you need to be able to flush through that biofilm in that system to get any bacteria, get any, uh, uh, you know, um, bugs that could be living in that pipe in that biofilm of that pipe he said you can't just open a faucet and assume you're going to get enough flow velocity through a four inch copper pipe going through that building to be able to flush that stuff out of there so he talks about the same thing about getting that flow velocity up that you know you're going to get a good flush and and flush out the um uh the biofilm and the bugs that uh, could be living in it with uh for the legionella protection so i'm going to talk about that a little bit more on monday and um, hopefully get permission to use some of the slides to to make that point so all right, so there's different ways that we've dealt with um, getting dirt and debris out of systems over the years, and forever it's been a Y strainer or basket strainer. There's different names for this type of device, but basically all it is is there's just a little cartridge that goes in this Y pattern here, and it's a perforated metal. It could be a fine mesh screen or something like that. So any dirt and debris that's coming through the piping here it gets trapped in this strainer. Um, you have to go back to these and you have to purge them out because what's going to happen as the dirt and debris comes and it gets collected in this basket, what's going to happen, the pressure drop is this uh, green line that we're showing right here is going to go up and up and up and you're going to get to the point where if you've got a pump downstream of this, or you've got a heat exchanger, you've got a boiler, whatever it might be that this device is protecting, it could be an air coil, you know, up on the ceiling, you might have a little Y strainer protecting your uh, balancing valve on that. 
you'll get to a point where uh, you're not going to get enough flow for the performance you need. And you could know that uh, by putting gauges on it. If you had a gauge on both sides of that strainer, you see as the pressure starts going up on this gauge, it's telling you that your strainer is plugged up. Now, in some cases, you can just open a valve on here and flush it out. If there's some big particles that were trapped inside there, you can usually just flush them out. It can get to a point where you get enough dirt and debris, especially if you've got oils and solder fluxes and Teflon tape, that you actually have to get in there and remove that basket that's in here, take it out, take a wire brush to it. In some cases, uh, replace it if you can't get it cleaned out enough. So while they do a good a job of removing the particles, they also can cause problems as far as reducing your flow from the day you put it in. In fact, here's a one-inch Y strainer right off the shelf, and you can see the pressure drop. Well, about a pound and a half pressure drop going through that Y strainer brand new. And that's because of the, the size of the mesh. Typically, they're going to be a number 20 or a number 40 mesh in there. So, you know, coarse enough that you don't block them up the first day you put them in there, but hopefully fine enough to get the small particles. So we look at this type of device when we develop a product, Clevy, and say, you know, is there a better way of doing this? How could we make a device that would do the same job, maybe even a better job, but not have some of the baggage that comes along with the Y strainer, which is the strainer gets plugged up and then your flow is reduced. So in some cases on the bigger, in fact, I think my next picture shows that you'll see some uh, installers will use a, st a startup screen or a startup um, strainer that they'll just put in, run it for maybe the first day and then they'll come back, they'll remove that and then put a different mesh size in there. So they're just trying to, you know, purge everything that was put in uh, during the construction of the job and they'll remove it. And you'll typically see those in the uh, suction diffusers. In fact, I kind of highlighted it right here, thanks to Bell and Gossip for this picture, um, that this comes with a little, a disposable startup strainer that you're supposed to go back and take out after you get this um, this system up and running, maybe run it for their same, what, two days there, 24 to 48 hours operation. Go back and take that um, that one strainer out, and then there's typically another strainer that you can leave in the behind. So this does act as a, you know, kind of an ongoing Y strainer, if you will, as well as a startup device. So uh, we still think we've got a better mousetrap and that we've got one device that you could do both these things without having to go back and changing anything, you know, taking one out and putting the other one in. Uh, for a permanent solution there. Yeah. But uh, any of you guys that do bigger commercial work are probably familiar with these um, suction diffusers. You know, they do more than just obviously the straining. They're trying to straighten out the flow before it gets in the pump and uh, also makes a nice sharp right angle turn. It has uh, some flow diversion veins and stuff in there. So definitely worth the money, but know that the uh, we can do as good a job as the particle removers they can do with that type of device. We'll get to that in a second. All right, so we got a little bit of a uh, poll question, two poll questions that we're going to run here just to kind of get a feeling of uh, the audience a little bit and what you do and stuff. So I don't know if Mary or somebody's going to run that. We'll give you a couple seconds yeah, we'll get to, those uh, launched up here. to answer, and then we'll see what we uh, what we learned from this. So we've got our first poll question here. What three ingredients can cause ferrous oxide to form? We're talking about gases, gaseous oxygen, water, and iron, dissolved oxygen, water, and iron dissolved nitrogen, water, and iron, and carbon dioxide, water, and steel. So go ahead and vote on this one. Uh, looks like we've got quite a bit of progress going here. Uh, yeah. yeah. This was a little bit of a trick question on that one. In fact, we, we Cody and I both have to get our heads cleared a little bit from the boss on this one, make sure that we're... <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it looks like we're, we're about half the voters coming in. Wow, they're still coming in, but it... Definitely looks like they're on the right track, so I can appreciate yeah. that. We're going to close it up here, and uh, looks like we've got a total of 69% uh, for dissolved oxygen, water, and iron. So congratulations to 69% yeah. with the correct answer there. And then we're going to go ahead and load up one more poll question. Yeah, I was, I was impressed that that many people knew that. That was a, a little bit, like I say, of a trick question, but it's good that you're on the right page as far as what's causing okay. that corrosion in the system or can cause it. <laughs> then we'll load up this next one here. If water is made non-conductive, ferrous, ferrous oxide won't form. Is this a true or false statement? We'll let that run. When we talk about ferrous oxide, we like to call it boiler ink because that's what it looks like when you drain it out. You drain the water, a little fluid out of the bottom of your boiler, it comes out black like it, like it was ink out of an old ink pen or something like that. Actually, there's small particles of uh, 
metal in there. That's what's causing that to be black. It's almost like a pigment black paint, I suppose. And, you know, it needs to come out because if you have any uh, pumps with magnetic motors in them, it's going to be attracted to that. So this is becoming more of an issue now with the new, uh, you know, smart pumps or high-tech pumps or electronic pumps, if you will. So that's why we're, we're kind of harping that, uh, that, that type of removal. And we'll show you how we do that going forward here. So um, looks like we got about 60... 2%. We'll go ahead and share it there. It looks like we got a stumper there, Bob. Yeah. Um, a this is a true statement. If it's made non-conductive, ferrous oxide will not form. So, um, so yeah, just a bit of a stumper there for you guys and uh, something to keep in the back pocket for you. Yeah. And we'll, we'll talk about those. We're going forward now that I see what the, uh, what people are thinking out there. <clears throat> All right. Let me go here. So, we talked about the wise train and how Clapper said, you know, there's got to be a better mousetrap, a better way to do that. And what we come up with is what's called a separator. And what a separator does different than, than a strainer is it separates the particles and it drives them down to the bottom here. Sorry, that looks a little cloudy, doesn't it, on that graphic? Um, and we drive the, the particles out of the out of the path, out of the fluid path. So instead of trapping them right here in a fine mesh strainer, basically what a separator does is it comes through there, it hits all these little uh, veins or fingers, if you will, in there, and the particles drive and you collect them here, and now you can go back to that job. In fact, that looks like iron ferret right there, the black color, and you can uh, just open this valve and blow it down. So you don't have to disassemble, you could, there's a seam right here, you don't have to disassemble and take this out uh, to be able to service it. And you're not gonna re be reducing your flow from the first day you put it in here as you start blocking up like you do in a strainer or a cartridge type of filter. So that's really the, the biggest difference is that we're separating instead of filtering or straining. And in doing that, we make this a very big diameter chamber because what happens is fluids come in a pipe and let's call this, I don't call it a one inch pipe. If a one inch pipe has flow going through it at let's say eight gallons a minute and that eight gallons a minute comes into a big room, so to speak, a big wide open dome or chamber here, what happens is that velocity slows down for the amount of time that it takes to cross this, uh, this bell or this dome or this big room that we put in there. And so we're using a couple different mechanisms here to get that particle removal. Number one, we're going to slow down that velocity. And if we slow that down, some of the big particles are going to drop out of solution just because they slowed down as the velocity slowed down. Uh, the mesh gets, a, or the coalescing media, let's call it in here, gets a better opportunity to work over a wider footprint because we're slowing that velocity down. It's going to disperse as it comes through all these different veins. So we've got a lot more surface area exposed to that flow going through there. So what will happen with this type of coalescing media is we'll get a much smaller particle uh, pulled out of the solution, out of the fluid, because it's a multi-pass device. So the first time going through, let's call these the big rust particles, let's call these orange uh, particles in here, those we're going to grab the first time. These tiny ones, and I'm talking about a five micron, and uh, an idea of a five micron, if you pull a hair out of your head, again, it varies, but that's about a five micron. So by the time the water goes through there, about 20 or 30 passages through this, we're going to pull a particle down to a five micron size. You're not going to be able to pull a five micron out of a Y strainer with a 20 mesh uh, strainer in it. It's just the openings are too big. There's no mechanism that in that strainer for that to happen. So by using the coalescing media, by using the low velocity zone, we're gonna get a higher performance device. Basically, we're gonna get the smaller particles than we ever got out of the system before. We're gonna get them out quickly and we're not gonna um, cause a restriction of those in our flow as we do that. So then as we looked at this device and what happens, uh, uniquely for Kleppe here in the US is a lot of these products are developed in Europe where the hydronic industry is, I would say a few years at least ahead of us. So the, uh, the high efficiency pumps that we're seeing over here, the electronic pumps, uh, pick a brand, you know, the, the Grandfoss Alpha, uh, Taco's got a whole line of electronic pumps right now. Those pumps were over the European market before they made it over the US market, number one, because they were 230 volt, they wouldn't work over here, but you know, until the market developed over here. So it gave us an opportunity to learn some of the, um, the problems that those pumps could have if you have these small uh, magnetic particles in your system, this iron ferrite buildup, which is the breakdown of your metal turning into what I called again, boiler ink. So we developed a magnet to go around the outside of this um, type of device, a disc dirt mag here, a, a, 
dirt mag, when we put a magnet on it, we add the mag to the end of it. And so what the magnets are going to do is they're going to catch a particle that's even smaller than that five micron. In fact, down to a 0.05 micron. So take 100 times smaller than that hair on your head is a 0.05 micron. And that's how small of a particle that, um, that can be in the fluid when those metals start to break down, which is why when you drain it out, you don't even realize there's a particle in there. You think it's just black, dirty water from touching the metal when in fact you've got that 0.05 um, particle size in there and that's why the magnet is going to help um, pull the smaller particles then we can drive out with the even with the coalescing media struggles to get a 0.05 out there so that's where you get the big win we're going to get the big chunks we're going to get the five micron size and we're also going to get the 0.05 by adding the magnetic function to it same thing you take the band off um, the particles drop to the bottom here they come off the magnet and you flush them out I actually made some clear demos of that you can really see um, how that works and here's one um, that I built in my shop I thought he made these clear bottoms so you can see right there where the particles are stuck to the magnet I made a clear upper part so you can see where the bit you can't see all of it here you can see where the bigger chunks of, are coming out of solution as they hit the coalescing media that's some of the copper shavings and some of the Teflon tape and different things that I put in there shut it off and you can see it's in the process as we speak of it uh, draining down to where I'm going to open the valve and flush it out take the band off, all this magnetic particle is going to fall to the bottom here, open the valve and flush it out. So it's really becoming critical that you have that magnetic function if you're going to, but even if you're not using the smart electronic pumps, someday somebody, probably sooner instead of later, is going to add one of those pumps into the system and they're going to appreciate that um, they've got this protection for that pump in their system. So it's, uh, we're being driven that way based on, uh, you know, the efficiency standards that the government's uh, imposing on us to get these circulator pumps up to higher efficiency. An excellent hey, website. Oh, go ahead, Cody. Uh, I was going to say, we actually had a, a kind of a good comment slash question that came in. And, and I think you kind of touched on it here a bit, but uh, the question was, uh, do you recommend using separators in lieu of Y strainers on domestic piping systems? If so, what locations would you recommend? And and uh, I don't know if you want to tackle that one or you want me to take it. It's up to you. I want to hear your opinion. I got uh, I know what my answer perfect. would be. But I want to make sure you're on the we're on the, the same first. Page the first question whatever. is uh, is a is a standard as far as uh, you know low lead brass. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. think you're going to find a dirt separator that's that's going to be low lead brass. So that's going to be the one thing that's going to stop you from doing that because yep. you can't put leaded brass into your domestic water systems. But the other big problem is with domestic systems is that you're always moving fresh water through there, and and that's what really separates these fresh water systems from a, a closed loop hydronic. Is that in a hydronic it's the same water going around and around in a circle all the time, which is why separation can be so effective because it is a multi-pass device. Uh, if you take and put that dirt separator in a, a, a potable system, it's designed to be a multi-pass device, but you're only sending water through it once. And, and it's not going to catch all those little fine particles um, over time because it's you know constantly getting fresh water going through it. So uh, definitely would not recommend, in my opinion, uh, separators on domestic piping systems uh, you're going to have to stick with y strainers or some type of media filtration i don't know what are your thoughts bob yeah that's it exactly i don't know that i could add anything to that and that's why you have companies like pentair and and people that make cartridge type of strainers they want to grab it all the first trip through there and that's where the cotton wick or the different type of medias that they put in those cartridge type of uh filters um are, are for domestic water for for that reason because we don't we don't have an opportunity now maybe on a domestic water recirculation you would have that opportunity but again it, it's got to be a, um, a low lead brass product to begin with so we're uh, it's a moot point as far as being able to use one of our products in that application and that, like Cody said I don't think it would do an adequate job for um, for that application and another good question Bob too uh, uh, good question here have you seen issues with ECM hot water research pumps collecting debris and locking up if so what do you recommend you know that's an excellent question and no i haven't because i'm not allowed to feel as much as i used to be but i would think you know usually the the magnetic particles that we see in the system are from the ferrous metals in the system breaking down because of the oxygen in there now obviously with potable water you got fresh water coming in every day obviously oxygen's coming along with the air that's entrained in that water and you typically don't have ferrous metal components or shouldn't have in a potable water although we've all seen cast iron pumps on domestic water recirculation but if you don't have you know the ferrous metal to break down you won't get that debris that typically um, what we call the boiler ink again that's what we're seeing in the hydronic type of pumps you have any other thoughts on that Cody or no I think you hit the nail on the head there I mean you're you know the 
the idea of, of these, uh, you know, magnetite or boiler ink in domestic water, you know, hot water research loops, it's not going to be there because you you technically shouldn't have any um, ferrous materials in that loop at all for the most part. But, uh, um, but yeah, you know, I think you're hitting the nail on the head. All right. Well, thanks. Um, I put this in here. This is an excellent website, by the way, to go and do a lot of research on different things that um, go on in closed loop hydronics, well, chilled water hydronic systems of all types. But this just kind of talks about oxygen. To, and this has been going on. This isn't something new that's been happening. They talk about how it happens, why it happens, the temperature of the water has, a, you know, plays in the factor of how much uh, oxygen can be pulled into a system. So if you're interested in scaling or foaming or some of these issues that you have, it covers steam also, not just the hot water systems, but steam. Uh, I would highly recommend you snoop around at the Lens Tech's uh, website. They've got a lot of FAQ free information there for you, and obviously they sell products and um, uh, solutions for systems. It, it tends to lean towards more commercial and industrial stuff, but I just like the way they explain the things here. You know, they they show the chemical formulation here and stuff like that. It, it kind of clears it up a little bit, like how and why does that happen? Well, if you know a little bit about the chemistry, or I know <laughs> I know enough to, to be dangerous, but you know, if you can follow through all what's going on in these equations, it all starts to come together. And I just think they do a good job of uh, breaking that down and explaining it. So I thought I'd throw that in there. Now, let's take it a step further, and if we're going to go through the, um, the steps of putting the device in the system, why wouldn't we put a device that can do air removal, dirt removal, magnetic removal? So this is what we call a three-in-one device, and basically another picture of the same thing. This is actually an air dirt uh, magnetic removal that I, I put on my display out in the shop. So same thing, you're going to get all the functions in here that you need. Um, I would say this is a high-efficiency device that belongs on all high-efficiency equipment, boilers, chillers, whatever it might be. And we can size that up for you, you know, to whatever you need. We go up to what 14 inch pipe size. Um, if when we get above six inch, it'll be a, you know, on legs, a base mounted, a little bit too much weight to be hanging off your pipe or hanging from some uh, all threads. So this is what happens on these bigger ones. Since this is a steel vessel, what we do is we put a brass dry well up inside here, and then this magnet goes up inside that. I'm going to have a picture of that coming up. Now, on the bigger devices, you'll get multiple magnets, so we've got a little bit more power inside there because we've got to light up, you know, a big chamber that we want to make sure that we can get as much contact in there as we can with the uh, and a couple more magnets. So this is serviceable. We do sell this as a separate component. So if you want to hit a welder and you're wanting to weld one into something existing system, you could uh, just put a one-inch NPT well in there and buy the um, the brass dry well and the uh, the magnet and stick it in there and kind of upgrade a system. So. Um, what else? I think that's about all my talking points on that. I'm watching my time here. This is kind of a clever one. What's unique about this is it's a composite, number one, but you can use this as a vertical or horizontal. You just loosen this collar right here and you can turn this. Uh, limited in sizes. We only have a three quarter, one inch version currently available on this, but this will cover most of the mod cons that are out there. You know, the piping coming out of the bottom of those is typically three quarter, one inch. And if you're anywhere below probably what, 12 GPM, this would be adequate for that. So it's nice that you have the isolation valves there. You've got the magnetic band. Um, you've got the port, like I say, you can put a hose on there if you want to put some, uh, inject some chemicals in there. And you can, there's a little air vent on the top here so that when you fill this up the first time, you make sure that you've got this, um, this filled up. And it is 100%. The flow, 100% of the flow goes through this. Some of them are a bypass where only percentage is going through the device here for the, uh, the separation and some of it's bypassing. Know that 100% of what's coming in here is going to go through the, uh, come this direction, actually going to go through the, um, the separator function through the band and that and then go off the other side. So, uh, so yeah, we covered quite a few different um, applications from three quarter all the way up to inch, uh, 14 inch. This composite dirt mag too, Bob, I think is a great thing to point out too, that that cap can come off and with the isolation valves on top and bottom, you can use that as a, a dosing device too for chemicals. So if you yeah, are using any of those cleaners and things like that, you can, you can drain it out fill it up with chemical and then put it back into service and, and then you don't have to worry about uh, purging out systems or anything like that. Yeah, but, and, uh, and that's an ex excellent point because when I would do, was doing systems, I actually had the cleaners and the inhibitors and gallon jugs. I didn't have the aerosol cans that I could connect on here and inject in. So that's like Cody says, shut the isolation valves, drain it out here and I could put, I don't know what, maybe a pint, probably a little bit over a pint I could put in there and dose my system that way as opposed to having to pump it in. That way I don't have to take the purge card or a pump with me to be able to put some chemicals in. So that's a good point. And know too that you can get different connections on this. 
Uh, since this does have the one inch G thread built into these uh, uh, forgings or castings here, I can go you know, copper sweat, I can go threaded, I can go press. Um, right now we got press in a lot of different products all the way up to two inch. So, and you could mix and match. Let's say you've got a, you know, you want to thread onto an old iron header somewhere on a boiler or whatever it might be. And you want to, you know, convert to copper on either a sweat or a uh, press type of fitting. You could mix and match and uh, put two different fittings on that, which is kind of unique and fun. Right, another another at? great question too. Um, somebody asked if the larger dirt separators are ASME, and the answer to that is yes. Uh, we are ASME all the way up to our 14-inch sizes. Um, for the folks from the north of the border in Canada, we do have CRN uh, all the way to that 14-inch size as well for all of our steel vessels, whether it be air, dirt, hydraulic separators as well. So. Um, we did have another good question in here, Bob, too. Um, okay. And this is always a, oh, this is a divider, I swear. Uh, with the Discal Dirt Mag, the three-in-one device that does air, dirt, and magnetic separation, where do you recommend installing it? Should it be on the return line coming back to the boiler or the supply out of the boiler? And I want to thank Mike for this uh, very divisive comment <laughs> because it's uh, <laughs> it's a very hot topic usually. Well, and I'll go first on this one since you went first on the last one. See how I do. So my opinion on this is it depends on the type of system I'm putting it on. So if I've got a brand new system that's all brand new copper pipe, brand new boiler, brand new pumps, brand new PEX tubing in the slab and stuff like that, I would put this up where I want to do the air removal. You know, it's going to do the best job of air removal at the hottest point coming right out of the boiler. That's your best shot at air removal. That's the best place to grab it. If I'm working on an old system where I'm putting a new boiler in on an old iron pipe system, let's say, where I've got cast iron radiators and I've got iron pipe or steel pipe and I know I've got a lot of rust and corrosion stuff coming off of the system, I might be tempted to put this down on the return side. I'm going to get air in either case. You know, the temperature difference going out of the boiler and coming back is going to be, what, maybe 10, 20 degrees delta T. So it's not a huge temperature difference that I'm talking about for the getting the air out of solution. So that's just my rule of thumb. You know, dirty old piping systems, put it on the bottom so I'm protecting my boiler, protecting my pump, protecting everything um, on the return side. On a new system, maybe put on the upper side. I don't know. It's going to work for both functions in either location, but that that is a question that um, throws people for uh, a loop a little bit. What do you think, Cody? Oh, I think these three-in-one devices, I think they, they work beautifully in chilled water applications because the the best place for air removal and dirt removal is the same spot and it's on the return and so that's really great for chilled water applications and like you said bob if you're using it in hot water applications uh heating applications uh i you know there's there's always a little bit of compromise there you know and if you are working on those dirty systems chances are they're older uh they're cast iron you know they're high temp systems to begin with so put it on the return side you know your your temperature is still going to be pretty high to get out a lot of that air as well um, yeah. but ultimately i would highly recommend separating your air and dirt removal on on your heating system so that way you could have them both in the ideal spot and you don't have to worry about it so yeah well put all right i think i got one or two more slides and i got some of the pre-submitted questions i think we covered some of them but if we get to the end here i'll, I'll go through some of those that maybe i didn't address in the slide. So this is something that's got me a little concerned is this, I don't know how well you can read this, but you can go to the Denver Water website. And what Denver started doing in March of this year is they started boosting the pH of the water up to between 8.5 and 9.2. And they're actually adding the chemical, uh, I forget what they're putting there, sodium sulfate, uh, I think it says in here, in there to get that pH. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to put a film inside some of the old piping in their, in their distribution network because there are some lead pipes and things that are concerned. So, and some leaded brass, obviously still in a lot of the valves and different components in there. So I'm just worried or concerned about what this is gonna do. This exceeds what most of the boiler manufacturers are uh, comfortable with. Uh, putting in your boiler. So, you know, while they're protecting the public by, you know, maybe coating out some of that, basically what they're doing is they're trying to put a film provider in here and in doing that, they're raising the, the pH of that water up. So I consider fill water to be part of the dirt and debris in a system. Now it's going to be, when we talk about water, there's two things about water. There's the physical characteristics of water, which is all the things that we've talked about already, the dirt, the scale, the stuff that you put in, the stuff that the manufacturer puts in, 
um, stuff that comes out of old piping. The other thing is the chemical makeup of water, and that's what's going to be the ions, the, the salts that are in your water. Wherever it comes from, whatever that water touched before it gets to you is what's in the water. It's a universal solvent. So if you've got, you know, a lot of scaling minerals in there, it's probably come through a, a limestone or an aquifer that's, uh, you know, putting that type of uh, iron, that type of mineral in there. So knowing that, what you want to do, and this is right off one of the boiler manufacturers' websites, the water that you put in there needs to fit within this thing, or like I spoke about earlier, you don't have warranty on the boiler. If the water you put in there doesn't meet this criteria, they could refuse a warranty if you had a problem with that. And what concerns me about this pH, if you know the way the pH scale works, you know, seven is considered neutral. And when we go up and uh, up or below that, every number is like a tenfold change in that. So when you go from say a, a eight to a nine or 9.2 or something like that, that's that's a pretty big jump. And so that could be a, a concern. So I don't know, I'm gonna, you know, the jury's out on that. Like I say, they just started doing that in March. I think it says over here, March of this year, 2020 is when they started adding that chemical to get that pH up there. Uh, and, you know, this will apply to indirect tanks that have coils in them, flat plate heat exchangers, uh, certainly aluminum boilers that are sensitive to that narrow pH range. Uh, we'll see where that's going to go. And I would say if this is successful for, um, I don't know how Denver is going to monitor if this is a successful program, you'll find uh, other water companies will probably follow suit. We know up in Flint, Michigan, for example, this very problem happened when they changed the water source and the pH of the water stripped all the biofilm out of the pipes and then they had the leaching issue. So uh, it's not just a, you know, a single city uh issue, it's going to be uh, an ongoing issue. And as things like Legionella and now with closed bin, uh, building syndrome and all that going on, this is starting to be more, um, uh, it's, in the, it's in the press, it's in the news these days. So uh, these cities, these public water providers are really concerned about uh, the water that they put to you. And I'm concerned about the water that you're going to be putting in my, your boilers and my components in the system. We want to make sure that those uh, components last and work properly, that they don't get scaled up to the point that they're, you know, not working properly or at some point not working at all. So um, a couple meters I would suggest you get, get a TDS meter, you know, that's the good number to know. If only one thing you know about the water, I would want to know the TDS and the pH of the water, two things, I guess, the TDS and the pH. And by the way, you can buy a meter that can do both of those for you. We sell it, you can get them online, a TDS meter that actually has a pH uh, reader in it also, but those are the ones that are going to be most important to the people that look at the um, at warranties or when you start having problems with pinholes or stuff like that. Those are the questions they're going to start to ask. So, you know, when you get down to this much um, data about water, you're probably going to have to send it off to lab to find out what you know percentage of all these different things you have in there. On the job site, you can without spending a lot of money, you can get a very good TDS uh, meter, you can get a good pH meter, you can get a hardness test kit. Um, if you want to start looking at chloride and some of the things that are within this TDS, then you're going to have to get into a, a more expensive number one, but more involved testing. Time to send it to a lab and get that. Uh, Oh, how's that for timing? <laughs> you're <right there. laughs> you're going to have to send that off to a lab. So I know that was a lot of uh, information. I'm going to, if you have anything, Cody, I'm going to look uh, over through these uh, pre-submitted questions, make sure I covered everything here quickly. Um, yeah, no, it's a great, great time to bring up just some of the great questions that came in today. Um, some pretty good technical ones, you know. Um, we actually had a good one. It looks like it's a question from across the pond, even Bob. Uh, he, he asks, uh, what are your thoughts on using demineralization resin to fill systems? What pH would you recommend at the filling stage and how long does the self alkalinization period take? Say that 10 times fast, huh? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, and that's a good question because whenever you strip everything out of water, you make hungry or aggressive water, you drop the pH of water. So if you took that, well, let's use Denver water at a nine pH, for example, and you ran that through a, a um, distiller, distilled water deionizer, um, Basically, what's going to happen, it's going to come out there. What did we measure it that when we did Kevin's like a 6.8 pH, you think, something like that? So you've, yep. you've it's a little it down, low. You've, you've made hungry water. So what's going to happen typically if you put that aggressive, that hungry water in a brand new system or even an old system for that matter, it pretty much self-balances. It's just going to pull something out of that system, some iron, some brass, some lead out of your solder, whatever it might be. And we found within a week, we went back and tested that again, in fact, a couple times because it's in Kevin's basement, so we we're able to do that. That pH did creep back up into that mid-7s, back into that neutral a little bit, you know, 
even to the alkalinity side. So we're of the opinion that that water will self-balance back up to a, a safe or a neutral range. If that concerns you, that's one reason why you'd want to put a conditioner in the day that you're at that job, because that conditioner is going to have a pH buffer built into it that will bring that and probably bring it up to a little bit higher on the alkalinity because it's going to put a film provider in there, going to put a coating on your pipe. I think that Romar chemical, again, is probably in the eights or nine pHs. It's been a while since I looked at their sheet, but if you take water that was uh, deionized, let's say, and you took it down to a 6.8 pH and you put some of the inhibitor chemical, you'd probably see it jumping up to eight or nines. So you might say, well, that's getting a little high. Do I need to buffer it back down? Well, no, that high pH is an indication that you put a film provider, like the chemical that Denver's adding in there, that's in there to coat the pipes and actually do some good. So make a long story long, if you are going to add chemicals to your system, you need to test that water with their test kit because it's going to tell you what the um, what the proper you know dosing rate is or when you need to buffer that back up a little because those chemicals will get consumed or used up especially if oxygen's getting into that system it's going to use up some of those um, scavengers some of those chemicals that are uh, in that system so we're of the opinion you should still start with good water deionized water which we can help you with we've got a cart that's uh, available that we can sell you for doing that uh, you can buy deionized water a lot of major cities have um, plants where you can you know, take a 55 gallon barrel with you and they'll sell you water that's been deionized, demineralized is about the same, you know, that term gets used interchangeably, but it's not softened water. It's not water. When you run water through a water softener, you're doing what's called an ion exchange and you're exchanging the hardness ion for the sodium ion that comes out of the brine tank. So you are in some cases increasing the TDS or keeping it the same when you run through a softener. Now you are stripping some of the minerals, some of the scaling minerals, the calcium magnesium out of there, but you might be substituting something that still isn't good for your closed loop hydronic system. So that's why we want to take it, the water a step further and actually strip everything out of it, strip all the ions, the positive ions and negative ions, get it down to just pretty close to 99% pure water. And then if you have to, if you feel you're more comfortable with, um, you know, boosting that pH back up, uh, you can put a pH booster in there or you can put a, a hydronic conditioner that'll boost the pH, but also give you those film providers and oxygen scavengers. So I think that's maybe what the question was and that's <laughs> controversial i know there's some in the uk right now there's a big push to use softened water in their boiler fills and they're saying well it's the lesser of two evils if we got 30 grains of hardness in our water we certainly don't want to put that in our system so wouldn't we be better taking it down to a five grains per gallon or whatever the softener would do isn't that better than uh, you know the lesser of the two evils if the water is in fact that hard well that's you know that's a call that you're going to have to make yeah i would agree if you got 30 grains of hardness barely coming out of a faucet maybe at that kind of hardness Maybe a softener is better than nothing at all, but we would like to go one step further and actually deionize that water as opposed to an ion exchange in it. Well, another interesting scenario too with demineralized water, Bob, and and you know you talk about self alkalization and you know the the TDS kind of coming up because the that hungry water is going to take little bits from here and there. Um, mm -hmm. our, our friends up again north of the border in Canada uh, have a tendency of using a lot of uh, PPR piping, uh, and so. We've actually run into, I ran into a scenario one time where they had uh, this big system, PPR piping filled with demineralized water, did exactly what they're supposed to do, and they couldn't get their low water cutoffs to work. Yeah. And uh, and so, you know, I at that point, I was like highly recommending, yeah, get yourself a conditioner, a, a pH buffer. It'll add some TDS in there. It'll make the water a little yeah. bit more conductive, and then your your low water cutoffs are going to work like a million bucks. And so, you know, you got to think about the the materials in the system as well. Uh, and, and if you're using those uh, conductive type low water cutoffs. Yeah, the probe type. And we did a test on that, Cody, when we first came out with that demineralizer yep. cart. And we found, I think it's somewhere around seven to nine. When you get down that low, those uh, probe type uh, low water cutoffs uh, stop working. There was no convectivity in there to make the connection for that, that probe to read. So, yeah, you got to be careful pulling it down. And you don't want it to stay that aggressive anyways. You would like to get that uh, that pH boosted up so you've got a little bit of conductivity on your low water cutoffs but also um, uh, so it doesn't attack your your less noble metals your copper your aluminums your softer metals that are prone to low pH attack there's something and I else did have, to go oh, ahead and I was going to say Bob I did make one mistake um, we have our steel vessels up to 14 inch with ASME but we actually only have CRN for the Canadian market up to 12 inches so I, I made that mistake thanks uh, thank you very much Kevin for reminding me of that um, but uh, but we've we've got a, a pretty big line there so if you whatever you need in, in commercial steel vessels we've, we've probably got them for you 
pounds. Yeah, I don't think they can handle over 12 inch up there legally, can they? That's probably a millimeter size up there. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> there was something. And was half the about. audience left. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was thinking something that you were saying uh, about the polypropylene is skip my mind. Anyways, we're on a little over time. Any other questions that were uh, coming in? That's you, quite a few people still hanging in there. I mean, we'll stay as long as people want to chat or have some questions. Um, we we had a question from Patrick about uh, where you can download the latest Idronics design manual. Um, if you go to our website, um, it, make sure first and foremost you're on the North American version of the website, and then right at the top there's a tab that says Education, and uh, that's where you can find the schedule for our Coffee with Kalefi webinars as well as Idronics. Um, that's a, a good one there, um, and uh, you know just some questions about or just some comments more about demineralization and and sometimes the cost that goes along with it you know that you're, you're literally paying for water at that point uh, so that can be a little controversial sometimes and I, I really think you know when too Bob you talk about Denver and their raising of the pH I think this is going to drive more and more systems to be isolated systems and not even connected to potable water supplies uh, which you're you're seeing more and more of uh, yeah. especially in glycol type systems which I'd highly recommend because you don't want to fill with you know fresh potable water if you got a leak somewhere you're going to lose all your your uh freeze protection capabilities but but yeah i mean I, I think we pretty much hit all the the good questions here and and any questions we didn't answer we'll be sure to get back to you on um later this week or early next week and uh, i guess we'll we can finish up there bob unless you have anything else to add no I, I, while you were talking there i went through the list i think i got to most of the questions on here some were specific to a job that i'll, I'll answer offline for those folks but I think um, if we missed you, certainly, uh, you know, email us or, or reach out to us again. We'll, if we don't know the answer, we'll certainly find the answer, get the right answer to you. So, hey, uh, Bob, um, Cody, yeah, this is Mark. I, I saw a question come through here. It's from uh, Ricardo. Huh? Um, dissolved oxygen, can it also attack um, stainless steel exchangers such as condensing boilers? I'm going to let you answer that, Mark. You're the, you're the one that set Cody and I straight on the, on the first one, so. <laughs> well, the biggest issue with dissolved oxygen is obviously reacting with ferrous metals, you know, cast iron pipe, what have, what have you. Um, but when it comes to non-ferrous metals, it's, you're typically protected with one exception, and that's the pH. If, yes, you get, yeah. if your pH gets out of range, like you mentioned, with the uh, glycol getting very acidic, then it can attack um, um, it, it can attack more noble materials like like stainless steel, for example. So, mm -hmm. so it does. It's not involving oxygen, but it involves pH. Yeah, and that's a, a a good way to put it because you know every metal out there has a I don't know, say pro and con or weak point. Even the stainless steel, you know, people think oh stainless steel, it's bulletproof. We can put anything in it, but you know stainless steel can rust. I've had it on my trucks over the years, and it does get rust spots on it. And it depends on the alloy. And there's I would say dozens of different alloys of uh, stainless steel. You might have noticed the indirect um, manufacturers over the year. They had 304, then they had 316, and they had uh, you know titanium stabilized some of the brands, and now they're using 409s. I saw some 412. Somebody was advertising the other day on their coil. So you know they're still playing around trying to find one that can cover so many different um, bases. And uh, I worked with some stainless steel fabricators here in Springfield, Missouri, because there's a lot of food processing here, and I had them actually make some racks for my truck out of stainless steel. And he asked me what grade I wanted to use. And I said, well, why would I choose one or the other? And he said, well, it depends on what you're doing with it. He said, you know, we do stuff for like uh, French's mustard is in town here. And he said, if we're going to put a mustard or tomato slurry through a stainless steel pipe, we use a different grade, a, a different alloy than we use for water for, uh, you know, cheese slurry at, at Kraft Foods or something like that. So he said, we really tailor the uh, alloy or the stainless to what's going to be going through it. So I thought of that when I started thinking about boilers. And I said, well, the boiler manufacturers then have some uh, decisions to make, you know, Know, what are they trying to protect against when they choose a grade of stainless? They want it to be a good heat conductor. They want it to be able to handle the expansion and contraction, especially if they're welding it. They want it to be weldable, but they want to be able to cover that uh, that pH range that you see from, you know, hydronic systems where, you know, the pH can be high if we're starting to put Denver water. The pH can be low if the glycol goes bad and it turns into acidic uh uh, you know, into an acid basically when the pH starts dropping in the sixes or lower in the glycol. So try and find a metal that can handle that wide a range uh, isn't a simple thing. And that's why uh, I think you still see uh, indirect 
of people still playing around with different alloys or even blended alloys. You'll see the tank made out of one alloy and the coil inside made out of a different alloy because it goes through different stress um, conditions. So, you know, you're going to get some corrosion in 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 any hydronic system. It's just a it's a a measure of degree. Yeah. I mean, you can't get 100% of all the dissolved oxygen out, so there will be some reaction. This isn't a bad thing when it comes to ferrous um, metals because that that reaction creates a protective coating, a, a very hard magnetite coating, and uh, it, it creates a, an insulator for any further corrosion to take place. So if you were to cut that in half, um, you know, that, that that good system that has a little bit of corrosion, that protective corrosion, that hard magnetite, you'll see that the surface has been somewhat coated by the corrosion process. So, um, and that's that's a good thing. But the, the key thing is to keep that oxygen concentration down to a level that 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 magnetite becomes an insulator, much like, um, say, um, um, wire is insulated. You can put two high voltage. You can put a high voltage source next to um, um, insulated wire. Uh, it, it's not gonna, not going to conduct until the, the thickness of that um, insulation becomes small enough that the voltage can actually jump. Um, so it's the same thing with the hydronic system. A little bit of corrosion is fine. Just got to hold the oxygen in check, and the pH typically um, systems will self alkalize uh, or alkalize. But if you have chemicals such as glycol, they do stand a chance to become acidic if they're not maintained. Yeah, that was a good analogy with electricity. And you know, th there's a fine line there. We want to protect a layer on our piping, but we don't want to get over a certain micron thickness or then our heat exchange goes down. And then Cluffy did some studies on that. In fact, it's in one of our technical documents on one of our products. I'm trying to think where well, we show a little graph, a little scale and saying how the heat transfer goes down as the thickness of that scale build up inside whatever the boiler wall, the heat exchanger, the pipes, or the radiators, whatever it might be. So there's a fine line. We want to protect the metals, but that if that buildup starts getting you know thicker and thicker, now we're starting to, to lose the ability to get the heat out of the fluid and into the uh, heat emitter or into the, the boiler that's putting the, you know, the fire to the water, so to speak. So that's why we, you know, that's why those numbers are so critical. And that's why you want to test ongoing, you know, you want to go back and see, gosh, my pH is slipping away. Time to, uh, you know, add some, uh, some boost or some inhibitor. And, you know, you can fix pretty much anything with water. If you get, if you get it soon enough, you can prevent, you know, major things from going wrong. Pinholes, you know, that's probably the biggest thing we chase with indirect tanks or with boilers is pinholes at the welds or pinholes from the, uh, you know, the aggressive fluid. We certainly want to, you know, we want to eliminate that so we don't have a lot of warranty issues and uh, consumers saying, you know, I don't, don't give me another stainless steel boiler. I got a pinhole in the last one. Well, it probably wasn't the boiler. It was probably the, you know, not enough attention paid to the fluid. I think uh, that's it. Well, thank you very much, Bob, for your time. And uh, I hope to see everybody here uh, next month as well for my webinar about the 10 things to avoid when designing a hydronic system. I'll be there. Uh, yeah, thanks, Bob. And, and uh, I guess everybody have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, team.